I'm going to try to keep this nice and brief, try to keep everybody awake on this. Uh, I apologize if this is a little rudimentary to uh, my colleagues in the room, but we really want to kind of establish a good uh, platform of knowledge uh, for the rest of the conference and basically talk a little about the aortic valve, how beautiful it is, and what can go wrong with it. So um, let's see if this works here. So uh, disclosures, I don't have anything pertinent to this uh, discussion, except that I'm not a pathologist and uh, I'm not a surgeon. So as long as you forgive me on those things, I think we'll be okay. I uh, do have to admit that before I was a cardiologist, I was a uh, chemical engineer and a biomechanical engineer. So your lecture was phenomenal, Dr. Allen. Really nice to see those strain stress curves and talk about flow reactors and whatnot. So that was fun. Uh, so this is obviously the aortic valve. It's beautiful. Just take a moment to look at it. It's amazing. And with the technology we have with TEE today and ECHO, it's amazing that we get to interpret and visualize a valve like this. And it is a, the most mechanically active part of the entire body. It's fun to visualize it and understand it. But we have to also realize that, obviously, things can go wrong with it. So what can go wrong with it specifically? I'm going to break it down into very simplistic terms and keep it in things that are most common for the reason. Uh, for aortic stenosis, we'll talk about what we've heard a little bit about already, congenital uh, changes, degenerative changes, rheumatic changes, and some of the few outlier things that might exist. For aortic regurgitation, we'll talk about it. And the way I like to think about it is I'll break it down into either a valve problem, an aortic problem, and I, I know Dr. Uh, Mahesh Ramachandran is going to talk a little more about aortic issues, uh, and then we'll talk about it, how it can, you can have a problem with both things. Uh, this is a, a somewhat old uh, paper that was looking at all surgical valves and the etiology of it. Um, it has some pertinence to us because uh, it does kind of mirror what we see as far as pathology in the aortic valves that are excised. Um, majority of the times that a valve is removed or excised and replaced is for steno uh, stenotic reasons with plus or minus some regurgitant component to it. And only about 10% of the time is it actually a purely regurgitant lesion. And I think that's f fairly uh, accurate to say. Um, of those, will, the stenotic lesions, you'll see that uh, it's pretty much divided uh, into congenital degenerative and some rheumatic, depending on where you live in the part of the world and depending on where you live in the United States, uh, the degrees of, uh, of occurrences related to rheumatic heart disease uh, varies quite significantly. Uh, and then for the aortic regurgitation, it can be an isolated uh, or a... Uh, combined effort, and we'll talk a little more about that as well. So let's focus on AES for the moment. Again, I apologize if this is uh, rudimentary, but we want to make sure that everybody understands these things. So for congenital aortic valve, the majority of the times that we see the issues is related to a bicuspid valve, 95% of the time. Uh, but on those times, you will see the very rare unicuspid, quadricuspid type of congenital defects. And these uh, bicuspid is the most common aortic valve malformation, and the second most common congenital abnormality. And it does occupy about 50% of the aortic valves that are replaced, and I think that's a fair number to say. Incidence, 1 to 3 percent, a little male predominance. Uh, it's inherited in an auto, uh, dom uh, an dominant fashion with an incomplete penetrance. Uh, and it's not necessarily just focusing on the aortic valve. There's a lot of things that, as we see as clinicians, we have to be very aware of it uh, and the and other anatomies, as well as the aortopathies, uh, congenital heart issues, and whatnot. So let's look at the types. Uh, and this is kind of a classifications we use uh, from surgical uh, colleagues, uh, looking at the Sievers and Russo classification. And uh, not to get too technical here, but just to get you, get you an understanding of uh, not all bicuspid valves are the same. Uh, if you focus on it, you would think traditionally that it would be the majority of the time it's just, oh, okay, they just cut in half, but it really isn't. Uh, the majority of times, what you'll notice is that it's a, it's a variation on that where we actually have a, uh, a missing or a leaflet here, but you would actually see this raffe here between the left and the right cusps. And that's the majority of times what it is, and you can get any different types of uh, interpretations based off of that where the actual uh, leaflet and configurations are slightly different. Now let's change gears a little bit and talk about degenerative uh, aortic stenosis. And this is the kind that you would generally see in your older population. Uh, we call it the atherosclerosis of the aortic valve. Uh, generally, it's a, obviously it's a, a tricuspid valve. The big key, key feature, uh, feature is that it's calcium. Calcium's everywhere. You see the calcium everywhere. It's a, you don't generally see a commissural fusion. Uh, you'll see the mounds of calcium in the cusps. So for the interventionalists in the room, the surgeons in the room, those of us who do TAVR, 
you'll know these and recognize these all the time when you're trying to place that pigtail catheter in the bottom of the cusp and you have this big chunk of calcium that's really prohibiting you from placing your catheter in the right spot. So this is kind of what we see. It's associated with calcium everywhere else with mitral annular calcification, coronary disease, uh, continue, the continuity of the, atro, uh, the aortic mitral curtain is sometimes very calcified as well. So this is the patients that you'll see. Rheumatic. Uh, it still exists in the United States. Uh, it exists obviously more in some parts of the country and more in uh, some uh, countries around the, the world. Uh, the key feature about it is that there's a commissural fusion uh, with a triangular shaped orifice. So that's nice to point out. We see that very clearly under echo nowadays. Uh, even with a good trans uh, thoracic echo, you can very uh, point that out. It's fibrotic calcium along the edges of the cusp as opposed to actually in the cusps. And the mitral valve is generally involved as well with the leaflet tip fibrosis and stenosis and a very classic appearing hockey uh, stick appearance in the under echo. Again, just to kind of summarize these different things, the biggest things, if you notice, with the rheumatic uh, features, more of the calcium at the tips of the cusps as opposed to calcific or degenerative, it involves these mounds inside the cusps as well. It uh, can lead also to regurgitation with rheumatic, uh, and obviously also well with the calcific, and then bicuspid as we discussed. So now let's look at the aortic regurgitation. Again, the, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, so I try to keep things simple in my brain. So I classify these in kind of two groups. One, it's a valve problem, two, an aortic problem, and three, a combination of both. So let's break it up this way. So if there's a valve problem, it's normally the aorta is normal. Uh, that's kind of the most common uh, cases that we see. Biggest things that we see are infective endocarditis, either active or healed. This is where you usually see the cusp being destroyed by the bacteria invasion. Uh, the cusp can prolapse as well. Uh, and it can be actual vegetation that prevents the cusp from uh, coapting, leading to regurgitation. Rheumatic, just as we discussed before and congenital bicuspid. But again, in bicuspid, if it's purely regurgitant, it's actually related to the unequal cusp size and not necessarily to a stenotic lesion. It's minimal calcium there. Another interesting feature that we don't see very often as a, a potential cause for a valve problem, but it's good to see because you, you might occasionally run into it, is with a discrete subaortic stenosis. So the etiology of this is actually, it's not truly a valve issue, um, but it leads to a valve issue is when you have some type of uh, subaortic stenosis, some type of lesion below the valve that creates a high flow jet that actually strikes the ventricular aspect of the cusp. And it creates a very thick and degenerative uh, changes in the valve that leads to these things. So that's an interesting uh, thing to see occasionally. Now looking at aortic problems, this is again um, the normal valve, but with a generally a, a central leak. You can see it with syphilis. We see this in a tubular portion of the aorta, thick and fibrotic aortic wall. So again, not a valve issue, just the stretching of the aortic uh, apparatus and Marfan's as well. And I think Dr. Uh, Ram Shadani is gonna discuss more of these things, so I won't touch too much on these. And then dissections. Now you can have problems with both, the valve and the aorta. Ankylosing spondylitis is what we classically would see as a rheumatic disease. It involves not just the tubulous part of the uh, aorta, the sinuses, but also the aortic valve cusps, leading to thickened, retracted, and pure aortic regurgitation. Also affects the mitral valve. And Marfan's as well can cause a purely regurgitant uh, lesion based on uh, a significant floppy cusp, as you can see here, from the weakened aortic wall, aneurysmal, it leads to a big defect. So hopefully with that, it's a quick course. Hopefully I didn't put anybody to sleep. Uh, just basically kind of giving you some type of uh, evaluation of what we're gonna be discussing throughout the weekend. So thank you guys.